We recognize and respect that New Westminster is on the unceded and unsurrendered land of the Halkamilam speaking peoples. We acknowledge that colonialism has made invisible their histories and connections to the land. As a city, we're learning and building relationships with the people whose lands we're on. Welcome to the City of New Westminster, New Media Gallery, and the event today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nina Bado, and I'm the Science and Technology Officer at the Swiss Consulate here in Vancouver. And the reason why I'm standing here and welcoming you here today is, as Sarah said, we're the initiator of the Swiss Innovation Fest, together with uh, Scott Mallory from ISM Arts and Culture. And um, this event is part of the festival, which took place in April. It was a, a one-week uh, event series, and uh, this is kind of the, con uh, the continuation of the to be continued of this festival. And um, we had an opening event with a panel discussion on arts and science at Science World. Um, we had a STEAM discussion at Emily Carr University. We had a hybrid discussion between um, the directors of CERN and Triumph here at a new, new Media Gallery. And uh, we had two exhibitions that we supported, one at Science World and one here at New Media Gallery. And we're really happy that we uh, could partner with New Media Gallery. Um, if you want to know more about the Innovation Fest, we have a website, we're on LinkedIn and Instagram, so we're happy if you check us out there. And today we're really honored to, to partner again with uh, New Media Gallery, with Triumph, with Arts at CERN, CERN, and today with Human Biography. Um, this is really um, creative minds coming together to create this dialogue around arts and science, which was the, the overarching theme of this festival. So I'm really happy that we're here today, and I hope you enjoy the discussion with a really wonderful uh, group of people and uh, the exhibition afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for being here, um, especially Laura and Monica. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a preface on um, how I got here. Uh, around nine years ago, uh, when I was doing my master's degree, um, I looked at uh, how I was going to intersect my own, um, my own career. And uh, I came up with an idea when I was sitting with one of my mentors who, um, who actually sat on stage with me at the time, uh, Dr. Ron Burnett, uh, who was the vice chancellor and uh, president of Emily Carr at the time. And I said to him, I, you know, I want to have a discussion uh, that varies between um, personalities and thought leadership and subjects. And uh, I looked at uh, art from his angle and I said, who could we get from the, from the science side? And he said to me, well, you know, have you ever been to Triumph? And I'm like, oh, I've heard of it. I've seen it. I've seen things about it, but I've never been there. And he's like, well, you should talk to uh, Dr. Lockyer, Dr. Nigel Lockyer there, who was um, the director there at the time. And we reached out to him and Nigel was like, yes, absolutely, let's have a dialogue. And so part of my thesis for my work was to have a dialogue about art and science and see what would match and what would be different and what would be um, just experimented in a live dialogue. And so we did that nine years ago and uh, we taped it. It was part of my, part of my work is uh, film work. And we taped it and we'd, it would been on television at the time and um, it, it, I guess it might be used for research purposes just to have, uh, have context of what people could be talking about. And this last year I was attending TED uh, in Vancouver and uh, it was in April and I bumped into my friend Scott here. And Scott had mentioned to me that he'd seen the, the video from that time and he said, would you like to do that again? And I was like, how do we, how do we recreate something like that? And um, here we are. And so I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I appreciate the New Media Gallery for giving us the time and the inspiration. Um, so thank you so much. And we'll, we will start. So I want to I first um, mention that for me, when I walk into a room and I see art, um, I think of two things. Um, I, I think of my grandmother, who was an artist uh, in India. She was a poet and an artist, my mother's, uh, my mother's side of the family. And then my dad's side of the family um, were engineers and scientists. That's where they wanted me to go. I just <laughs> never went that way. But we walk through the gallery today together. And I want to ask you both your first impressions of the exhibition, Indivisible. And um, maybe I'll start with you, Laura. Tell me, tell me what you saw and what you've seen looking at art and science from two different lenses. 
Something that I, I really love about this exhibition is that um, it does uh, appeal directly to our senses, mm -hmm. um, mostly to vision, but also to hearing and even to some degree uh, to the sense of touch. I'm able to have the confidence that what I'm seeing and um, in, uh, in one case hearing is uh, a direct translation of something that's happening um, either uh, you know, at a level of vibration mm -hmm. that I cannot sense in my body yes. or at a, a scale of particle activity that I could not perceive. And so you know, when I see work like this um, that is uh, you know, an indexical record of, uh, of actual frequencies or actual events, I feel such gratefulness mm. because um, the artwork makes them present for me. You know, I'm, I'm present with uh, with those uh, electromagnetic frequencies wow. or with those uh, those muons visiting the Earth. So that that is my first impression. Mm. Monica, when I was um, walking through the gallery with you, I was trying to think: Is she thinking with a scientist's mind, or is she seeing something beautiful in front of her? But I can assume that science is beautiful to you. So what was your first impression of what we saw? And, and, and whoever has not seen this exhibition, I encourage you to go see it after this. So you get a sort of visual idea. But today what we're talking about is really the ideals and, and, and sort of reactions to what art and science can be for you. So what was your impression? So my first impression was that actually we can add feelings to science. Mm. We can add feelings and uh, like empathy, beauty to what we are doing. People tend to think about physicists and scientists in general as people who are extremely logical, extremely you know, rational, without much of emotion, that creativity and so on. And that is not quite true. And being able to show that the way the artist did is phenomenal. Because the biggest struggle, struggle we have in our field is to be able to relate to our audience, whoever is on the receiving end of what we are doing. Uh, be it fundamental physics, be it applied science, it's so difficult for us to explain to general public what is the reason why we do what we do and have them relate to that. So adding that, like you, like you said, this uh, multi-sensory component to it, adding those, those feelings, having the public being able to relate to that, to feel that, you know, to, to see beauty of that, mm is like a whole different level. Yeah, absolutely. This, yeah. I love that you said uh, empathy, Monica, because uh, I really do think that these artworks invite empathy, and they invite mm -hmm. empathy with um, subatomic particles. Uh, they invite empathy with wavelengths. They actually allow us to kind of uh, put ourselves in the position of a, you know, a, a prion that's you know, colliding with antimatter and like, whoa, you know, exploding or um, put ourselves in the, in the position of a, um, an electromagnetic magnetic frequency. So for, and I think that science already does that, um, but it requires a more, a more specialized um, capacity to interpret the data. Is there beauty in data? And when you take it out and, uh, you know, think about that question for yourselves. When you find something that you've been researching and going through and then suddenly, like Willie really said, like the end, the end comes and you get this data and you taught me something in there. Yeah. You said it's only the beginning. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. So we scientists do see beauty in our data, but then it's uh, like an anecdote here. Whenever I see data, I see data points, you know, I, I see what I can actually learn from that and as you said that's the beginning for us it's not the end we start we start coming up with hypotheses we are uh, we start coming up with explanations build models and so on but you know what my son he would see beauty in it he would see colors he would see curves he would see galaxies in some of our data uh, so yeah there is beauty for sure and for us it's uh, like uh, what i mentioned during our walk uh, people are drawn to something that is usually either the biggest or sticks out, but uh, in our field, very often the smallest peaks, the uh, things that are coming unexpected are the beautiful ones because we didn't foresee them coming. We didn't know they were there. They disturbed our thinking. 
And you know, this is something when you take the seed, and, there is actually something more in that. And that moment when you see those tiny little peaks, it's like wash. It's, uh, it's hard to explain, you know, but it's like this, this moment when you, when you realize that you struggled for years sometimes, for decades. Some people are actually constructing experiments and trying to, to measure something for a couple of decades. And Higgs boson is one example of that. Five decades before he could actually see what he has predicted. So imagine that moment, you work for something for such a long time, and then you see that one point on your screen, that feeling you get, it's like you can't describe it. So yeah, that's what is beautiful to us, that feeling that you get, that accomplishment, that you, know, that you prove something, that you were right. That, that's what's beauty. I, I have a question for both of you. Um, is there a way, as an artist, as a scientist, to separate them? Or do they stay together in, 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 in exhibitions like this? Is it, is it, did you see it as art? Or did you see it as science? Or did you see it as both? I guess uh, I would say that it is, um, it's art that's working with science. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of these artists, you know, two of them were actually working at CERN. Yeah. And you know, two of them are, you know, they're, they're deeply collaborating with scientific data. But I think, you know, partly maybe Monica would disagree with me, but I think partly the question of whether it is art or science is who is the audience. Um, because uh, these artists are taking scientific data that's been achieved by others and are um, you know, amplifying it or editing it or translating it through algorithms uh, in a way that um, makes it more palpable and more dramatic for people who are not uh, specialized. Um, you know, probably scientists would get as much a kick out of these artworks as people who are not, and you probably have to care, you know, a little bit about science in order to care about this exhibition. Yeah, so that, that, that is one, one half of the difference. So I have to admit that I came to that exhibition as a scientist and I've seen science. That was like my first feeling. But then I had this phenomenal discussion with Sarah and she walked me through the artistic side of it. And that was so incredibly important, that dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, because it made me understood where she's coming from. And suddenly I have started seeing those pieces from a different perspective. I think the biggest problem, to like kind of relate to that question, the biggest problem is that uh, society championed the idea that art and science cannot be together, should not be together. They are so different. There are differences in profession, in culture, in language. And honestly, that exhibition is the opposite of it. Mm -hmm. It shows how the two of them, even though they seem to be going in two different highways, but they are going in the same direction. They have the same goal. Mm -hmm. They are actually trying to appeal to the same crowd, so to speak, yeah. to the public and so on, right? So yeah, I came in as a physicist and I, went out as a converter, converted artist, to be honest. Yeah. I, I'd like to say something That's about... That's beautiful, by the yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, it, yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, I, I'd like to say something about why, why I think that is the case, that these same works can appeal easily, uh, equally to um, uh, scientists and art lovers. And I think it is the indexicality, which is a term for... Um, the fact that the, uh, the image in whatever medium is directly caused by the thing that it is a sign of. So, you know, as a, as a photograph is an index of the thing that is, was being photographed. So when we can trust, when we have that confidence that the thing that we are seeing or hearing um, is existentially connected, to the thing that it is a witness of, um, that you know, that is a, a feeling. You know, it, it gives you a feeling of awe, which I think both uh, scientists and uh, artists feel, um, but also of confidence that this is something meaningful. Um, you know, because you know, like we really are in um, Yun, in uh, Yunshu Kim's Argos. For example, we, we are seeing actual muons, you know, from outer space. Live, yeah. Live, live muons. I mean, that is so moving. 
And so it's not a it's not a movie, and it's not an animation of muons, which would also be nice, you know, there there, uh, in our midst. So that that is that is something that um, science and some kinds of art have in common, but a lot of art does not deal in indexicality. I imagine um, laying in my backyard looking at the stars, and I'm looking at the beauty of it, and then I pull out an app to see what stars are what. I'm looking at that star map to see. What am I actually seeing? So, so I want to make sense of the beauty, and that's what we're doing here, is making sense of the beauty in, in our own sort of interpretation. And I, 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 in, our, in our communication back and forth, I, I remember the word that, uh, that I got from you, Laura, was um, how digital media po poetically translates. And I want to use that, use that word poetically, because when something is poetic, it, it's, it's kind of seamless and, and beautiful, and it just it comes together and, and very melodiously, almost like it's a beautiful thing and it, it happens very seamlessly. I, I, felt, I, felt, I felt that way when I was walking in the room with you both, actually. And I, and I didn't feel that the first time. I, was, I felt like I was just seeing things. But I, when I was talking to you both, I felt like, oh, wait, there, there's, there's a conversation about what's happening, so I'm hearing different interpretations. I was like, oh, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So there's something poetic about that. Well, I, I have to say that uh, uh, one of the strengths of uh, most of these artworks is that they're they're almost entirely analog, mm -hmm. electronic media. They're you know they're not very digital at all. Yeah. Uh, and so being analog is part of why you have the confidence in that connection. The um, uh, the exception, you know, to some degree, is that uh, the Hertzian no 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 um, Mirage by Ralph Becker. Um, it does have you know, those real analog uh, geomagnetic signals. So we trust that um, we are seeing a translation of these signals from deep within the earth. Um, but unlike the other artists, Becker is um, using a, uh, I forget the term for it, but a, a learning algorithm to, um, uh, to qualify and um, you know, elaborate the image that we see. So there, you know, those beautiful red curving forms. So there's something going on um, that this digital, this digital application is uh, aware of that we don't know. Um, but still, it's, it's just a filter through which that analog information about the geomagnetic frequencies becomes available. But yeah, so it is a poetic digital interface. And the other, the other ones have, uh, are almost entirely poetic analog interfaces. If, if, when, you, and when you don't see this exhibition, you'll start to see what we're talking about here. It's kind of like, first it's very, very, very like, like it's, it's a dark room and you see these lights and you're like, what is that, what is that? And then you're standing in front of it and then you actually see this beautiful, the, the beauty just comes out. I wanted to ask you, Monica, when you were involved with Arts at CERN, creating that program, was there room, was there, was there a lot of, was it, was it just like an idea to say, we want to introduce art, or was there like, there's already art here, we need to talk about it, we need to like bring it out. Can you tell me about that? Right, so, um, as I uh, mentioned before, there is this lack of communication between art and science. Uh, which is unfortunately hinging on society. So what yeah. CERN did at that time, they, they tried to minimize that gap. They tried to bring the two fields together. So how it all started, they, they brought a few resident artists mm -hmm. and they paired them with chemists, scientists, like physicists uh, at CERN. And I remember walking across CERN with one of them. His name is Ansel Mkief. He yeah. is a, a painter from Berlin. And we walked to my experiment and I was so proud and tried to you know, explain him all the physics behind and so on. And the things he resonated with the most were the colors. You know, the, the colors of the beam line, the, the materials that we are using. Not the details of it, but how it actually made him feel. So that's again coming to this uh, concept of feelings. Uh, that moment was, I, I pivoted in that moment very much because I came to appreciate that the innovation and be it in art, being in science or together, is actually, it hinges on our ability 
uh, to see things from different perspective, mm -hmm. uh, to to be willing to cross that boundary, to to be willing to sort of read between the lines and and try to relate. Because as I mentioned before, we do use different language, mm -hmm. we do resonate with different things, right? But at the end of the day, we are after the same goal. Mm -hmm. Science and art are linked by the end goal. We want to produce something, we want to create something, and then we want to disseminate that. We want to show it to, to the audience. And we researchers always think about that, yeah, I have to write a paper, I have to give a presentation, I have to give a poster. Artists usually think in, in categories of, I have to create a music piece or a poem or you know a sculpture or, or paint something. It's, it's not it, it's, uh, if you think about the process, and he helped me to realize that we go through the same process. Yeah. We are so similar. We create something, we try to understand that, then we go to the production mode, like me in the lab, and then he did the same with his painting when he was back in Berlin, and then we show it. And that moment, uh, it, was like, it, it was phenomenal. And then more and more people started coming on board that program because they started seeing value in it. We can learn so much from artists. I'm like, it is so underappreciated, but the way how we can show what we work on, like you guys are showing us all these different things we can work with. And without that initial discussion, without this initial dialogue between the two of us, how would we ever know about it? Can I ask Monica a question? Absolutely, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, Mo Monica, so, do, do you think that there's a, a similar process in, uh, I, I just love your comparison between, um, you know, in both cases it's a question of uh, having your research that you want to get out to a public. Um, so if an artist, you know, some, a lot of artists are multimedia artists and they might say, oh, am I, am I going to express this work as a, you know, a sculpture or a, or a video, for example. Uh, in, in your practice, is there also to some degree deciding you know, what medium you want to express your findings in? Yeah, thank you for this question. This is an extremely valid question. I think what is very important in our field is to figure out who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk to a general public, you would usually go for something fairly easy. Mm -hmm. They can follow. But if you change the way of thinking and you say you want to attract more people to science, because we see that people are dropping out of science, they don't see a value of staying in that field. Especially it's difficult to attract more female scientists, right? Mm. To, so what do you do? I'm like, they are generations younger. Well, you have to start speaking their language. Mm. We cannot use the traditional tools anymore. And this is unfortunately something that we, again, as, uh, as, as a field, scientists, we underappreciate that. We are so hooked to this traditional way of showing what we do with the stream media, like with papers and presentations and so on, mm -hmm. that we disregard an ocean of possibilities. And especially with new media, when you think about that, new media gives you this incredible explosion of quality That's and right. quantity mm -hmm. uh, of human creation. And we showed that just recently together with uh, with Scott and with Jesse, who are in the audience here, when we said, no, we are not doing poster session on paper anymore, no. Let's do something different. And we actually moved the whole thing into augmented reality and virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And that was an extremely difficult discussion. You would think, okay, people would embark on that, would be so inspired by it. No, people are afraid of the change. And then you have to kind of have them buy into that. But the moment they realize the value of it, going, you know, the road less traveled in science and applying art a bit more, the visual effects and applying to all of the other senses, it's um, it turned out phenomenal. Like, if, we, if we're referring to references in your life, right, and we're thinking about um, the outcomes of what we are seeing, how we interpret, um, why we even come to forward to, to, to even observe something, I want to talk about influences in your own life, Laura about your parents, were neuroscientists. Mm. Tell me about that influence and how, how that could have yeah. changed your outcomes. Uh -huh. thank, yeah. thank you for asking, Sherrod. Yeah. Uh, yes, both my, um, actually my mother and my father and my stepfather yeah. uh, are or were neuroscientists. And my, my father is also um, 
an amateur physicist. It's his true love. Uh, so um, growing up in a scientific household influenced me a lot, you know, from like playing in the lab when I was a child. But also, I guess, uh, you know, in, in many, many ways. Um, but coming back to our question of medium, um, you know, I would say that neither of my parents was an especially ex- successful scientist. Mm-hmm. You know, they did it for their whole career, and they're still you know, in their 80s and still doing it, um, but without a great deal of recognition. And I think that kind of comes back to our quest, you know, maybe to our question about the medium of expression. Mm. Were they not using the right medium? You know, they're both interested in making movies about their findings mm. now. Um, But it could also be a question of, um, you know, sometimes a scientific finding doesn't occur at the right time or doesn't doesn't find its audience, Mm. you know, and the the same thing happens with artists. Could there be a social lens on that, though, too, of where we are in our, in the trajectory of, you know, media, social media, all this stuff today, if you put something out there, there'll there'll be a lens on it. Like, you know, the new media gallery, I would have never known about the technology that was in there. But what is, what do you think the role of galleries are right now? For me, it's a point of inspiration. Mm. It's, um, Mm. you are coming to that place, like what had happened to me as one person, and then you're coming with a bit different perspective. And that disturbance can give birth to so many new things when you think Mm -hmm. about that, right? Mm -hmm. You, You start thinking, how can I do my job better to connect with the audience, with society, with general public a bit better? Because this is what we struggle with the most. Uh, science, unfortunately, is still not well understood by general public. And I put blame on the language, what we use. We very often fall back to our jargon, which is natural. But then also, what sort of medium we are using to disseminate our our findings. And we tend to publish things in very research-oriented papers. We very rarely actually go to the public and talk about what we do in the language they can actually understand. And gallery can be a place like that. Gallery can be a place to connect with people, to see what they resonate with and how, what we can actually learn from that, what we can take back, and how we can do our job a bit better. Uh, with that. I, I have an answer for you, Sharad, yeah. now, after uh, thinking and listening. And we will go to the audience very shortly. Oh, okay. I appreciate uh, that hand, though. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, about you know, your question, what, what, is, sure. what is a gallery for? Yeah. Um, I think it's really, it's really interesting that um, you know, art galleries you know, are defined as doing so many things and doing a social service and like presenting art that's uh, you know, critical and um, socially engaged and things like that. And it's actually very rare uh, for a contemporary, in contemporary art art circles to say that art is beautiful. And I remember a time that it was actually a bad word that you would never actually say about art. And I think that has loosened up a little bit, but still it's, it's not said very often. And I think that, you know, part of why we feel so easy to say that the, the artworks in this exhibition are beautiful is because you know, they're, they're coming from somewhere else. So we feel safe to say Safety. that uh, the scientific imaging is beautiful. Um, whereas, yeah, whereas if it were uh, like a critical contemporary artwork, we would, we would be a little bit more squeamish. Um, maybe I'm only talking about a kind of smaller, sort of more academic circle of contemporary artists, but um, I, I think uh, a gallery should be a place where, among all the, the other things, you encounter beauty. And so I, I'm really happy that that's the case in this show. It's also a place of gathering for all walks of life, right? This, this talk was really based on a lot of academic intelligence that came to, um, from great expertise. Me, I'm, just kind of, I'm kind of a layman artist, you know, journalist, documentarian that wants to just walk in and see things. But I'm learning. I'm learning the academia behind art and science. I'll add, I'll add another question to your research. Um, 
Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. You've been doing a lot of research in that. As art assist in that, and how does that do that? That's a very good question. It's um, indeed, so my research is trying to figure out the origins of uh, why we get sick, and especially wow. those two uh, diseases, as you mentioned, and uh, it's not easy. I'm like, if it was easy, we would know how to treat Alzheimer's 100 years ago. I'm like, when you think about that, within 100 years, we have developed so many vaccines. We even know how to treat certain types of cancers. But for Alzheimer in particular, we are still at that point when the first patient was diagnosed in Germany. We haven't moved at all. So what's the reason for that? We have all of those tools. We have all of those capabilities and, and new means of studying that. Well, it's part that we still don't understand how our body works, right? Wow. When, when you think about that. So what my particular research group is doing, we are, as chemists, emerging ourselves more and more into physics. We decided not to go the beaten path, but see what physicists are doing, because you might not be aware of that. We have in our body elements that are out there, which are coming from, from the universe, which are coming from directly from the Big Bang, which are coming directly from dying stars, supernovas, and so on. Those are the very same elements. So now you have physicists who are studying those elements using given techniques and uh, given tools. Why can't we do it? Like chemists, why can't we use those same, the same techniques? Uh, to study the, the, the problem, right? So that's what we are doing. And here you see that merge of two fields. Because again, chemistry and physics are classified as science, but they have different fields. They have different languages and so on. So now kind of following your question, how would art come to that picture too? Again, it's the same. Can actually art help us or like, can science and art together forge a better public understanding of mm. what's going on? Probably yes. Wow. After asking Monica about the art in her science, I was going to ask you, based on your background in visual and cultural studies, art history, and sociology and anthropology, how do you define science when you walk into a room? Well, it's a, it's a very big question. My, my answer is probably not all that interesting, but, uh, you know, scientists, I mean, I, you know, I, I have lived with scientists, and I've seen their, their created process and their research process, um, uh, and it is, it is different from art, because, um, you know, the, the research question is, um, has to be quite precise, but... Uh, and the methods to try to um, to solve the question have to be quite precise, but there also has to be, you know, I, I think there has to be at some point in the research process a lot of um, openness mm -hmm. and uh, creative imagination. Is there emotion in science? And if you can talk about that, there is. There is. There are a lot of emotions, feelings, and mm -hmm. empathies in science, but. Don't judge me, but I think we are really bad in showing that in science. <laughs> um, like the, the, the question you, you asked me at the beginning of this discussion, mm -hmm. if I see beauty in it. Yes. Yeah. Beauty to us comes from the emotions of seeing, of in a way materializing what you have been after, and that uncertainty where this will take you. Mm. Because uh, contrary to art maybe here, it, we never stop. There is, there is no stop. There is always something coming. You, you never complete one project and you say, that's it. There is nothing more to be learned from it. It's not true. You can still divide things. You mm. can still go to a different scale and so on. So all of that is uh, part of at least what I define as emotion, mm. that, uh, that feeling you know, of being accomplished and, and being happy and uh, relating to it and that really enormous happiness when you actually find what you have been searching mm. for for such a long time. That's probably it. And so I'll ask you a very similar but different question. Is art completely emotional? Uh, art, I think art is mostly not emotional. Mm. And that, you know, at least, are you talking about making it or like receiving it? I think a bit of both because mm -hmm. sometimes there's a there's, there's, mm -hmm. 
I shall just I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to your interpretation. Okay. Actually, yeah. yeah well, I uh, I I, uh, I know a lot of artists, mm-hmm. and uh, I really think that uh, you know ninety five percent of art making is um, you know really hard work. Yes. Uh, and then there are um, you know all kinds of emotions come with that sure. process. You know from uh, you know curiosity to frustration mm-hmm. to fulfillment to you know anger to joy. Um, and I think the process of uh, receiving an artwork like we like we do at this exhibition includes emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I think or at least my my ideal way for receiving art is uh, is for it to to begin with the body and the senses, as mm-hmm. we were talking about uh, uh, at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. That we we begin by seeing, hearing, perhaps feeling, smelling, etc. And um, uh, and then that starts to make us feel things that you know we might be might not be able to name, um, and they might at some point express themselves as emotion, but it might be more like a bodily feeling, like you know I feel elation or I feel crushed or something, and then uh, you go through that process, and at some point you may have thoughts. So, you know, I really like it when the process of experiencing art moves slowly mm-hmm. uh, and thoroughly from, from the body to feelings to pro- perhaps to emotions and to thoughts. Um, often it jumps in, in the contemporary art context, it often jumps straight to thoughts, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I find not so interesting. But, you know, again, that's one of the beautiful things about this show. Um, is that it starts with the body, but you know, there's this, there's a little bit of thinking, of course, that happens Absolutely. at the very beginning because you know our body is uh, uh, experiencing something, and we're thinking, I I am seeing muons. Mm. <laughs> so is that's right. <laughs> and having elation from that feeling and watching it. Exactly. Absolutely, please, and then we'll get a question in the Something audience. Something that triggered what yeah. you just said. There is one more emotion which is really dominant in our field is when you get to inspire someone. Inspiration. Yes, it's uh, because sometimes, like as I said, we are working in silos in, in, in science, but yeah. then with whatever you are doing and however you are doing, and you have someone, we're often much younger, coming to you and saying, you know, you inspired me. You inspired me to stay in academia. You inspired mm. me to, to see things differently. You inspired me especially to make a change. And in a way, by doing that, leave the world a bit better place than it is. So that, I think, for me personally, is the strongest emotion. That The moment you hear that, that you inspired someone mm. to do something. First of all, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I want to acknowledge our esteemed uh, panel here, Laura and Monica. Um, It was an honor to sit in between you and ask these questions and learn from you both. Um, What I did learn um, in this process is that we all have passion. And you know, to finish something or to complete something or to keep us going through something, we have to have passion to get through it. And I can see the passion in both of you. And I am so humbled to sit here with you. I want to thank everyone who made this possible today. And I think the last thing that I just want to leave everybody with is just lead with curiosity and and keep asking those questions and keep discovering. Thank you so much.